everybody. How many people we got so far? 66. 66. We're going to double. We had 250 sign up, so this is going to be a good session today. How's everyone doing? I know some people are coming off of some team sprints from this morning. Hello, everybody. Up in the chat where everyone's coming. Where's everybody coming from? What part of the world are you coming from? All right, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. For those who are here for the first time, welcome. And for those who are returning, welcome back. Today, we're going to be going through the Salesforce Project Life Cycle. First and foremost, let's go ahead and introduce our clicked coach, the amazing Mo. Mo, do you want to tell us a little bit about your Salesforce journey? Where do you come from? How you came to clicked and your experience so far with the Salesforce Project Life Cycle? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, we'll do. And uh, welcome to all of the 80 plus people still counting upwards that have joined uh, for my session today. So that's right. My, my name is Mo. Um, Mo Jasset. I've been in the ecosystem with Salesforce for now probably coming up to 12 plus years. And I've been doing CRM for about 20 plus years. Uh, so before Salesforce came uh, came along, there was um, CRM systems which are on premise, not in the cloud, with servers running in the back room. Um, so I used to sort of manage uh, manage those those applications and solutions for a, an end client, and then I went into consulting in the late 2000, sort of that around that time when Salesforce started to take off. Um, so I've done a Salesforce implementation globally, and then I decided loved it so much I wanted to work with an ecosystem. So I joined. Uh, System integrator called Accenture, which some of you may have heard of, uh, did some work there. Then I moved on to running a Salesforce practice and building up a Salesforce delivery practice at Capgemini for about five to six years. Um, then I worked up, then I decided to do something completely different and moved to a very small partner to do smaller projects for a period of time before moving back into uh, a larger integrator today at Cognizant, which is where I'm at. Where I'm at. Uh, so at the moment, I'm a director at one of the uh, one uh, cognizant UK and, and Europe, and I look after the Salesforce partnership um, between our organisation and Salesforce. So I get involved in a lot of client discussions and projects and planning projects, etc. So yeah, all good fun. Um, and as I, you know, delighted to be here on on the Clicked uh, program. I've been I've been working with you, Rachel, for a good few months now, but I think with Clicked, it's probably coming up to nearly a year since I've been working with Jeff. Um, and we've done so many of these types of sessions and each one is just uh, very different, right? So it's amazing to to come on and do these sessions with with, with, with the audience that we have. So hopefully today you'll learn something uh, around the project life cycle, even if it's a new topic for you. Um, those of you that uh, want to come and present, be great to see what you've got. Uh, don't be shy uh, because that's how we learn. So I'm looking forward to learning from you as well as hopefully imparting some knowledge uh, that I've accumulated over a number of years around uh, project life cycle. Absolutely. Yeah. So Mo, if you've been with us for a year, then I, I must have met you about six months in my first team yeah. sprint. I got to interview you as Ezra White, who we are going to be meeting again in our scenario uh, a little bit for the first time. So amazing. And for those of you who have already completed the challenge or would like to come up on stage, there's a little raise your hand button, which is going to allow you to actually come up and present. But we'll run through that here in a second. So first off, we've just done our overview. We're going to go over our prompt and basically just introduce you to how this hour long session is going to work. We'll give Mo a chance to give us some tips and tricks about how to go through the challenge and also about how to kind of dissect and break down the project life cycle. Then we'll start the challenge. So what that means is I'll present you with the scenario and the task. You can either listen to us. Me, Mo and I will be talking about the project life cycle. Uh, I will probably be cracking some jokes that nobody else will laugh at except me. It's totally fine. You can go off screen and work on the challenge. Or if you want to listen in and kind of tweak your work as you go along, that's also totally fine. And then after that, we'll bring people up on stage to get some live feedback, which is 
the most amazing part and also for Q and A. So how you can interact in this session is obviously there's the chat here where you can interact with everybody that's here. And if you have a question for either Mo or myself, you can put it into the Q&A box, and then we'll show that question up on stage uh, to help you and assist you with completing this challenge. So let's go ahead and see. If you're here for the first time, please give me a heart emoji. Let us know who is here for the first time. Amazing. Yes, we've got some newcomers. And for the people that are returning, give me a wow. I see so many familiar faces. It's just awesome to see the community growing um, as things go on. So for those of you that are here for the first time, core clicked principles in these sessions, we learn from each other. It's co-creative, it's discussion, it's feedback. It's not a lecture and it's different every single time. It's a safe space to try. We're all about cultivating the growth mindset here. So come up and present, ask your questions, even if all you have is something on a Word document that breaks down potential things to put in the four stages of the project life cycle. We want to see it all. And if you've got a full thing built out in Salesforce with different phases, we want to see that too. Uh, we're always surprised at what people bring up. And then, of course, have fun because basically what this learning session is, is an improv session. So don't hesitate to have fun, ask questions, send us a funny gif, and hear any thoughts that come to mind. So without further ado, let's introduce the scenario. You are a Salesforce consultant working with Slack. Up into this point, Slack has only used Salesforce to track data for the B2C side of the business. They want to uh, begin using Salesforce to track it as well on the B2B side. So you are going to be assisting them in implementing a solution by adjusting their current Salesforce instance to support this request. Before you dive into the solution, we got to break it down. You're going to map out the project into the following phases, discover, define, design, and deploy. And this is going to help Ezra. Uh, and Logan and their team know what to expect at every step of the project. We do have some interview notes for you, which I'm going to go ahead and pop in the chat for easy access. So if you want to go ahead and look at those interview notes, go ahead and do that. And then the task will be for you to complete the following steps to map out your project into the following phases, right? Discover, define, design, deploy. Just uh, consider all the steps that will be, be necessary to complete the project, write them in a list, and then kind of order them. If you've got time and you can create a slide deck to share your work, then that would be awesome. However, you present this information to give Ezra and his team a big picture um, and, and how you're going to be assisting them. So that is the scenario and the task. Mo, what tips do you have for us? Well, um, we could probably write a book on <laughs> on the project lifecycle, but unfortunately, we've only got less than an hour today. Um, but yeah, let's uh, let's keep it simple. So this framework that we've talked about, the, the four, they call the four Ds: the discover, define, design, and deploy stage. And I think today, you know, what what uh, I'd like the audience to do is to consider what fits under those four categories, right? So if you were going to put a project plan together what you know today as of you know what's what's needed on a Salesforce project and some of the some of you have been on previous sprints so you understand the things that we've done around things like stakeholder interviews, you know, creating user stories, creating business process maps and all that, those stages that you've been through on one of the longer sprints. Consider all of those steps and then just try and map those into the project life cycle. You know, where do they fit? What's the sort of logical order? Um and, and typically, you know, that sort of very high level, that's if you can sort of understand that concept, then when you start to get into some of the more medium, large type projects, then, you know, having that as a as a framework will really help you. So the tip is, you know, my, my tip is look at it logically, look at which order you're going to put things in to make it easier to play back to your stakeholder in terms of what that plan looks like. Um, now, the plans can vary. You know, I've seen plans which are detailed down to the nth degree. You know, you've got hundreds of lines of things that are going on, you know, on various weeks and days. Um, and, and, you know, quite frankly, these days, um, when, when you're implementing Salesforce projects, what clients are looking for are not reams and reams and pages of detailed planning. What they're looking for is for you to deliver Salesforce very quickly. 
and and that's why uh, the agile methodology for delivering projects is very popular amongst mm -hmm. Salesforce and Salesforce customers because it allows you to deliver something that's working within within weeks, not months or years, mm -hmm. but within two or three weeks. So the four D the four Ds, if you like, there's a part of the four Ds which will be iterative. So it'll it'll be like a circular thing that you go round and round. Uh, and, and that could be for many months and it could be for many years, right? Because you're always building stuff. But initially you'll have the discovery phase, you'll then have a define and design stage. There's no, there's no reason why in six months time after you deliver the project, you go through the whole thing again, because the client wants to get more value out of the, the, the Salesforce investment. So, you know, imagine these sort of, the four Ds are processes that can run iteratively and, and uh, you know, one after the other as well. So it's not just one project. You could you could divide, divide this up into many mini projects and mini releases. So um, yeah, it's it's a very sim simple concept that uh, Salesforce themselves also speak to their customers about. If you go onto Trailhead and have a look at anything to do with project lifecycle, Salesforce also uses the same language, the four Ds as well. Um, so yeah, so my my tip would be think about what you've learned and done so far on the the clicked platform or on trailhead and then map it out into the 40s at a very high level perfect thank you for that mo all right so without further ado we're going to go ahead and start our timer i'll be going back and forth between the scenario and the task but in the meantime mo could you kind of break down the difference you mentioned the agile methodology so i know some of us might be familiar with that whether either agile or scrum could you kind of explain the differences and the similarities between an agile project and a salesforce uh, in terms of their, their life cycle yeah, so so typically, if if you look many years before cloud sort of took took over and Salesforce took over the CRM world, projects were typically delivered um, over a period of a long time, right? So you'd go, th you'd you'd have a waterfall project. So you know you'd have a project plan where you'd you know start with probably some discovery phase, then you'd build everything, test everything, and release everything, right? So at the end, the so the customer has got the final solution. Um, now, what, what's happened over the last 15, 20 years, you know, since CR, CRM and cloud technology has come on board, is that customers want to get in, you know, get something up and running in terms of um, functionality very quickly. And Salesforce is really good at that because a lot of the stuff they, they have within service cloud or sales cloud or even the industry clouds that they've now launched so they've got manufacturing cloud, consumer goods cloud, all of that, pro all of those products that Salesforce has lend themselves very well where you can simply just start the, you know, install a sandbox of that product and literally within a few clicks, you can get something together to show a customer, right? And it's usable. You can actually put data in, you can get data out. So the agile methodology is is lends itself really well to the way Salesforce is delivered because what agile does it allows you to you know very very quickly understand the client's requirements break those down into manageable chunks of work and then actually develop it very quickly and then release it so people can start using the application straight away um, and and generally that first piece of um, functionality that you release could be something like an MVP, a minimum viable product, it's normally called. So it's, it's, it's not the complete solution. It might be only 10%, 5% of what the client is looking for at the end of the day. But nevertheless, you know, the, the users can use that. They can put data in. They can start to get a, get a feel for how it works. And then over a period of several weeks, you build on top of that solution. So you go through that uh, circular motion where you, you look at the next bunch of user stories that you've created and deliver those, right? Uh, so it's all done in very small chunks. So you've got, you start to deliver value, incremental value for the customer. So, you know, if you're, if you're a BA on, and, and you're in the Salesforce ecosystem, understanding agile project methodology uh, is pretty critical because most clients want that. The, the, in reality, what happens on projects though is, um, a lot of organizations aren't ready for agile so they expect 
uh, that you're going to be delivering something which is almost complete in the next you know, two or three weeks. And when you start to sort of set the expectations that, no, we're going to deliver this in, in, in phases, um, a, lot, a lot of organizations struggle with that. And one of the reasons why is that they are not set up to manage that sort of change. So if you, if you imagine, right, if suddenly tomorrow you train Rachel and me on Salesforce to create a sales record, right, that's great. Then next week, in two weeks' time, you're going to release another uh, piece of functionality that allows us to uh, create opportunities. Now, in two weeks' time, you're going to have to bring Rachel and me back and train me on that, right? So organizations have got, you know, are struggling to sort of keep up to, you know, uh, get their users in that motion where they're building their knowledge incrementally uh, because a lot of organizations are busy doing their, their day job and they don't, they can't spare people to do the training and there's a lot of challenges associated with agile yeah. so agile is a like great the, concept but it, but in reality the jungle. yeah it's yeah. a very difficult concept uh, for a lot of clients even large clients to understand yeah it, it, it definitely is a different methodology and you know i think Correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding about traditional project management might be more of that traditional waterfall method where it's like, we're going to deliver something fully to you and then we're going to really backtrack our steps and potentially have to completely scrap something, which can be good for small things. But if we're working in software development, if we're working in Salesforce with things with lots of complicated steps, we want to prevent the amount of time that we are spending rewriting and revamping but getting that feedback right like what you talked about that mvp as quickly as possible so uh, you know as, as you were talking about this adoption of agile i couldn't help but wonder like in your experience if you've got a story or an example what were some of the things that or or, or the impediments or challenges that users faced in, in trying to adopt this new method uh, um, I mean, there's there's a lot of pitfalls, you know, that, that you can come across when you try and implement uh, Salesforce using an agile methodology. The biggest one, I guess, is that the organization hasn't got the right structure to support the uh, the speed at which you're delivering things, right? So if you are creating functionality and deploying that every two to three weeks, typically, because those blocks of development time and testing time and release time could be as small as two weeks or three weeks and they're generally referred to as sprints so agile also has its own terminology and, and uh, you know you've got to get used to the vocabulary because there's lots of different things that they they call you know various things like sprints and then there's um there, there's user stories there's you know the the, the whole Thing around scrum scrum meetings daily stand-ups there's a there's a lot of ceremonial stuff that goes on in agile which which again if you get in what i would recommend is just sort of getting on a basic course and understanding that terminology and how it works but the issue uh, and pitfall is that the organizations are finding it difficult to actually handle the, the 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 agile and govern that because if suddenly you know if we are a team of developers and we've developed something in the next 10 days we then need to get that tested, right? So we need to get that package of functionality tested. So to test that, we need users. We do a user acceptance testing at that point. And typically the business will say, well, our, all our users are busy doing customer service or they're on taking phone calls and I haven't got anybody. And therefore then you get a project delay because you haven't got the resources lined up to be able to test that functionality, give you feedback and release it. So that has a knock on effect on your next piece of work so typically the pitfalls are that you know when when you start the project the client hasn't been uh you know told very clearly what the expectation is you know how this is going to work um and they always think oh we'll leave the developers and the project team to it and it'll all happen it doesn't happen because agile is a bit of a marriage right it's a bit of a partnership if the client doesn't do their bit then you as a project team can't do your bit. And that's where you tend to get a lot of friction because you're waiting for things to be signed off. The client's saying, I haven't got people to sign it off. Um, I don't have the people to test it. 
Uh, and by the way, you know, we're doing some major product launch in two weeks' time, so therefore we haven't got time to do anything at the moment. So therefore, it then you know becomes a delay. So that it's typically all the governance stuff that surrounds Agile, which is always the biggest problem. So my recommendation, and this is something we, we do a lot now, is we'll spend half a day or a day with clients just to help them understand what we need from them, the level of commitment that's needed for the project to succeed. And if any of those pieces don't happen, then the client needs to ha understand very clearly that there's going to be an impact on time and cost and resources. Because mm -hmm. if you imagine, if there's a two-week delay, what are you going to do with your developers? They can't just sit there and twiddle their thumbs if there's no work to do, right? So, you know, the client's not going to be happy paying for people to sit around for two weeks either. So, you know, you start to get into that very tension or tenure, should I say, relationship, you know, when mm -hmm. these things start to emerge. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not more, it's, it's more about the governance and the people and the change and organizations being ready to take on Agile versus the process. The process is pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and I like that you describe it with, with the marriage almost. It's setting the foundation of these are the expectations. This is how things are going to go. These are This is what we need in order to make it work. Of course, understanding that the client wants their problem solved, but you as the BA or as the consultant, knowing how the project is supposed to go, being that subject matter, having that conversation to, you know, clarify it up front. Such a good point. Yeah. We're, we're yeah. going to bring up a question from Leanne. Uh, since you don't have time to write a book today, is there one you recommend we read or have on hand as a reference for project planning or management best practices? Um, I would suggest that you, uh, you, you try and get onto a foundational course uh, around Agile. Um, there's a, there's, I'll, I'll share the link with you on um, on Slack after the call, but uh, there is a recognized sort of foundational training program uh, over a number of weeks. You can do that self-study, um, which will give you all the basics that you need around uh, agile project delivery. Um, so my recommendation is every BA, if you get getting into sort of the BA world, you need we really, really need that basic understanding of agile. So you don't need to be a scrum master. You don't need to go into in depth. But you need to understand what the Agile process looks like and all the different parts of the process and how they come together. So it's a really good question, Leanne. What I will do is I'll share a link so you can have a look at, you know, the, the sort of foundational course. And there's lots of providers. So you don't have to go with the one I suggested. So you can go on Udemy or whatever. But I would get a recognized um, foundation in, in Agile. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, definitely look forward to seeing that link. And also just look up the Scrum Guide. I think that will give you a pretty clear understanding about kind of how things are broken down at a high level, even without a training to be able to read through that. Uh, we'll, we'll do yeah. another question from Sita. I heard if we are on a Scrum team, the project management pre PM, Sita, clarify if, if, you, if by PM you didn't mean project manager, uh, doesn't have much work. Is that correct? We'll start with question number one. Um, the, 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 well, the PM does have a lot of work because, uh, you know, the, the, the coordination, the orchestration of the project doesn't go away. So, um, you know, if you've, got a, if you've got a bunch of user stories, they need to be refined, they need to be signed off, they need to be prioritized, they need to be estimated, all of that stuff. It needs to be orchestrated by somebody so the pm is still going to be pretty busy right um there's going to be developers that look at a user story they'll have a, probably a bunch of questions because you know user stories are designed to be pretty pretty high level so you know uh, if it's a complex user story then you know you need to go back to the client and recheck things or you might make assumptions which you want to validate with the client so there's a lot of stuff that does happen where the PM needs to be involved and be the interface between the project team and the client. Um, now, sometimes the BA takes that role on, which is perfectly fine, um, but the PM still has to worry about things like data migration, data preparation, you know, training, deployment, all of that stuff. Somebody needs to take that responsibility on. So I, I don't think in any way it diminishes the PM's role. It's just that, you know, that they, they, they work more of an as, as a sort of 
a, a conductor, right, conducting the orchestra, making sure everything's happening and everything's moving in the right direction, um, managing risk, managing uh, and then mitigating risk as well. So there's, they do get involved in a lot of, uh, 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 I would say, sprint reviews, etc. So those all need planning as well, right? So yeah. you'll have a post, um, uh, you know, post sprint review. Uh, before you you go on to the next sprint, so it's it's a there's a lot of feed feedback loops involved in agile where you get feedback from the users plus feedback from the developers and you sort of iterate and improve things as you go along. Yeah, hundred uh, percent. So question two from Sita: What kind of documents are prepared in a Scrum framework project? And if I can kind of you know for for the purposes of this session being the Salesforce project lifecycle. What sorts of documents would we be preparing in each of those phases? Um, typically, you know, if you start with the first phase, discover phase, you're going to do your typical client stakeholder interviews, which we've done in previous sprints. Those will all need documenting to some degree. Um, so a BA would, would have documented those, converted some of those into business process maps, for example, in terms of how they do things today and how they want to do things in the future. So there'll be a as-is business process map and the to-be process map. Once you've got a bunch of requirements, you need to filter those down into specific user stories. So there'll be user stories which are documented and stored uh, and, and refined. Um, you might use tools like Jira to do that or just a simple spreadsheet, depending on the complexity of the project and the type of client and the tools they use. So user stories is, a, is an essential element. There will also be things like a risk and um, risk log, a risk register, um, where you start to identify any risks or assumptions that that that, that you need to record as part of the project. Um, so those are sort of typical documents. A training plan, you'll have that as well. Don't forget training, which is pretty important. People often leave that till the very last minute, but you need to sort of think about your rollout plan and your training plan. Creating training content, are you going to do that? Um, yeah, so there's there's all those sort of typical documents that, that, that you'll have. There'll be functional specifications for some of the complex stuff that you're building. So you'll have design documentation, functional documentation, you'll have architecture diagrams, depending again on the complexity of the project. So there is a fair bit of documentation that you do need to do. And people often think agile means no documentation. That's not strictly true. But, uh, it doesn't get you out of doing documentation because it has to be there. Um, yeah, unless unless you want a headache it. of, yeah, unless you want a headache of trying to remember everything and letting things yeah. slip through the cracks, 100%. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And often I get a comment saying, oh, well, it's agile. I don't need to do a, I don't need to do a functional specification. Well, you do, because if we revisit that piece of functionality in a year's time to amend it or change it, we need to know how you've built it. So, you know, documentation is still a key element. And, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a, a myth around you don't need any documentation if you're doing your job. It's not true. Unless unless you can literally <laughs> remember everything, absolutely yeah. write it down. And also to have data to go back to if the client says, well, we want you to do this, then you can come back and say, no, we talked about this. These are the user stories. These are the requirements. If it's on the product requirement document, then you, you've got something to go on as well. Yeah. Yeah, and and you'll have you know there's there's things like data migration, which again is you know in big projects you need to sort of bring the data in from another system. So you need to then have a mapping table saying, okay, if I take uh, a field call address line one from system A into Salesforce, where does it map to? Which field does it map to? Is it in the right format, or do I need to transform that data to be in the right format? So there's a lot of considerations when you start to get into very complex global projects. If somebody's starting Salesforce from scratch and it's a 20, 20 person business, it's simple, right? It's like yeah. you can, you probably don't even need to do any configuration. They could probably use a lot of the stuff out of the box. Yeah, out of the when box. You're, yeah, when, you, when you're sort of dealing with large corporations with global presence, like the Unilevers of this world, et cetera, then that's a completely different world, right, in terms of project, uh, because you are, you literally have to do everything by the book because you are building a solution for hundreds and thousands of employees uh, across different geographies with different language requirements, different uh, flavors, slightly different flavors in how they operate. So it becomes a big challenge. 
how do you yeah. get all of that into Salesforce? Yeah, communication for sure is, is key there. We'll take one more question and then I'm going to bring up someone on stage. We'll start the presentation portion of the skills challenge. Could you give an example of something that would go on a risk log or, or a risk record? Yeah, so it, it, it could be that uh, you, you've got, you know, you're getting towards the end of uh let's say the define and design stage and you're about to deploy something but you've you've got to a point where the client hasn't come back to map your data for example so they've got a, a whole load of data that's residing in an old system and you need to get that data across right otherwise you can't go live because the 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 the, the, the customer service representative or the salesperson is not going to be able to see the the, the record the customer record in Salesforce unless that data comes in somehow. Now, if for any reason there's been a delay, that's the sort of thing that would go on a risk log, a project log, to say, if this thing doesn't happen by date X, there's a risk that this project can't go live. Okay, it could something could a risk could be a dependency. So there might be something that you need to do in terms of integration. So you're pulling data from another system, and that integration requires teams from both sides, from the Salesforce side and the other other system side as well, to work together to create the integration point. And it may be that there's a dependency there because, you know, you haven't got that resource or, you know, a resource is on holiday and therefore you don't identify that as a risk because potentially that could that could be something that is quite critical to have that integration, but there is no resource there today to be able to do that. And what you would then typically do is you build up that risk log and review that risk log on a weekly basis with the project team to see what the risks are and what are the mitigation strategies that go against that risk. So what are you going to do to, to mitigate that risk? And if I take that first example around the data migration, it may be that you know the, with the clients you agree we're going to put some we're going to pull somebody out of the business for a week and get them just to focus on the data mapping. Um, and that then basically mitigates that risk. So with each risk, there should be a mitigation step as well as to how you can mitigate that risk as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that risk log is a living and breathing document that you will update throughout the project because risks appear throughout the project, which you then need to log and mitigate. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Okay, Mo, I'm so excited for the, the Agile Skills Challenge that we're gonna have coming up uh, uh, next month, but we will go ahead and hand it over to Akansha for now. It looks like we've got a presenter that wants to share her work. Um, and, and for everyone else, if you do want to present your work, now's the time. Go ahead and raise your hand uh, to come up on stage and present things for live feedback. Hello, Akansha. Hi. Hi, Rachel. Hi. How's Hi, it going? I'm good. Hi, uh, how about you? Uh, one minute. I think I want to share my whole screen again. I... One moment. All right. Sorry about that. And so, so everyone me... knows Akansha is one of our stars. She's uh, come up on stage several times. So I'm trying, to, I'm like... trying to break that cycle of, you know, nervousness, anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're doing great. And for everyone that has that maybe your standards aren't as high, just know that this is what can happen when you continuously practice and continuously improve. So, all right, Akansha, the stage Definitely. is yours. So can you see my slideshow? We can. We can, yeah. Okay. So I just want to mention like uh, uh, Mo did the same session, I think maybe some months ago, five months ago. And I joined that, but I didn't know what to do and where to put those things. Mm -hmm. So when you posted this session, I was so excited that, yes, I can, you know, work on it. I can show what I've learned so far. I would like to thank the, thank, say thank you to the coaches and the click community. No, it's great. Great to see that, uh, you know, this is, this is the beauty of click click where, we, you know, if you come to the same session two or three times, it's always different, right? And you learn something very different and you can learn right. on. So it's great to hear. So I I will start my presentation. I don't have a script for it, but I will try to do my best here. So we are here for the Project Lifecycle Skill Challenge. And I would like to uh, give you some overview that um, since our last meeting, we know that uh, Slack has already implemented Salesforce for B two C side of their business. However, uh, you know the B two B operation sides they are equally 
interested in implementing Salesforce for them. So how things started was we met with the stakeholders, Ezra. We uh, spoke to them, what are the current challenges they are facing? We came to know about their pain points, like the data was fragmented. There was a lot of social sharing the support users or the customers were doing, and there's a lot of automation we need. And also different teams are not able to communicate properly with each other. We even observed the end users performing their day-to-day -day activities to gain a better insight that how their current system runs and also studied any provided documentation or their current uh, business process maps if they had any. So going moving forward from them, I would like to present uh, my task, like how we're going to work on this uh, implementation project and how we're going to cover it. So here are the things we took the require. We're gonna take the requirements from the stakeholders. We're gonna validate and reiterate them back to them, each of them, and maybe break them down into short set of user stories. Also, uh, drive a future state business process maps, which will show them how their new system would look and what are the gaps from the old system to the new system. And coming to the user stories, we would wa want independent user stories, which are negotiable and small and in, um, testable. And my, me and my team, we are planning to write all those user stories and load them into Jira, uh, uh, creating epics and different sprints. And I'll be working in coordination with the product owner and my development team, seeing which stories or which user stories we can complete in which sprints. And I would like to notify here, since we have already got a sign off on the, uh, we'll be getting the sign off on the BRD, which is the business requirement document after validating all the requirements. So in case there are any changes, last minute changes, once we are into development, uh, we would follow the criteria of, you know, uh, documenting those changes and again, notifying everyone um, about the risk involved if it's the new change is going to, you know, push, push us out from the our project timeline. So this is one thing I want to mention so that we don't end up in any scrub creep. So moving forward to the design phase, uh, when uh, we start our sprints, uh, we are planning to prioritize our work. So as me and me my team discussed, uh, loading the data from your different systems, since you mentioned the data is fragmented through various systems, it is going to take a long time. So we are looking forward for two to three sprints on uh, for this functionality. Also, our top priority would be creating reports and dashboards for your different team member of teams and uh, the VP of revenue, Ezra. And since you mentioned uh, there are still some, you know, contract uh, processes that you want to change, it's still manual. So we will see if we can uh, use a app from App Exchange or any out of box solutions uh, or provided by Salesforce for the same. And once uh, this is done, like after every sprint, we plan to follow, uh, do, do the sprint retrospective and get your feedback, how far we have reached your expectations on this particular module. And once we build out the MVP, we would like your super users to test it. And uh, definitely we'll be providing the uh, user acceptance testing scripts for the same. And if there is any feedback, good or bad, we would like to take it and you know, work uh, moving forward on that after your feedback uh, on the MVP. And if the stakeholder, you and your team is happy with it, we would start going to deploy the changes. We'll roll it out to the live environment. And as discussed, uh, we will be providing trainings for uh, training for the users since I know it's a new system and your team is all excited for the shiny system, but we'll make sure we provide enough training so that they can use it effectively for their work. And also uh, we would be providing you product support as mentioned in our SLA. So that will be uh, done from our side as well. And I know you mentioned that your team is excited for the new system, but I would still prefer doing one or two sessions on user, user adoption training so that uh, they know like what the new system looks like and how they can use it efficiently to meet their goals. And you know they can chat with their clients, uh, take them out on a coffee. So uh, that's all what we have planned so far. Amazing. Going yeah. live. <clears throat> that's really clear, thank you. That's 
Great. And that's the end. Thank you. And this is the first time you've put this together? Uh, yes, because I um, uh, the last um, session I mentioned, I wasn't able to even find out anything from those notes. It was for Red Cross America Society something. So I wasn't able to do, but now I know how to put things. And I did work on it yesterday because today we, I didn't have time. So I worked on it yesterday and I did put in the different things in different sections. Brilliant. Well, first of all, congratulations, because it's amazing, you know, how far you get, get come along this journey to be able to very clearly put the right things in the right uh, parts of the, the process, right, along the four Ds. So everything in there, I, I, I would not change, right? It's, it's exactly where it should be. So amazing job. Well done on that. Uh, uh, what what I'll do for the benefit of of the audience, right? There's some really good stuff that you 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 uh, presented there. So I'm just going to pick on some of the slides and just go through those again because there's been a few questions that have uh, come up on the chat as well. So yeah. brilliant start, and I think it's a great uh, it's it's a great presentation to kick off with because there's so much learning that we can get from this. So if I can ask you just for the benefit of all of us, if you can go back to the very beginning to the uh, discover. That's the one, yeah. So um, let's start here. I, in in terms of this slide, exactly what discovery is. It's about understanding the challenges, the pain points. Um, you know, meeting the stakeholders. You mentioned that uh, you sat alongside some of the the, the 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 guys that were actually doing the role. Yes. Um, again, you know, there's lots of lots of jargon we use in our business, but typically that's called a ride along. So you mm -hmm. basically sit sit and have the ride with them and you see how they do their job yeah. and what process they follow. And the other the other big thing that I want to pull out from what you said is that you also, as part of discovery, ask them what they have today. What are the processes that they've got documented today? Because you'll save a load of time if they've got it already documented, right, in terms of a BA. So I think there's some really good uh, golden nuggets, we say, of uh, um learning that we can pick up from what you said there on the discover slide so that's great if you want to move on to the next one i'll pull a few things on to that which was around the defined stage right so again everything in that slide you see around what's involved in the defined stage you have a business requirements documentation you gather your user stories create them uh you group them under epics you might want to then even go down level and group them into sprints logical sprints um, get them validated with the product owner, get them signed off, and really lock those. Um, yeah. Because the other thing that you mentioned, again, jargon, we call it scope creep, and I think there was a question in chat from somebody, what does scope creep mean? Scope creep means that when you get to this point, right, you have an agreement with a client, this is what we're going to build and this is what we're going to deliver, and that's yeah. what you're going to sign up for. Now, once you start building and getting feedback, um, the client might turn around and say, actually, no, 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 it's, you've got it all wrong. This is not what we wanted. We wanted not X, but we wanted Y. Uh, and in order to deliver Y, it could be quite a lot of effort from a developer's perspective, from a right. BA's perspective. And therefore, you know, the, the, the scope of the projects change, and therefore you, you've then got to re-estimate stuff. And it may mean that there's an impact on your project timeline. There's an impact on the cost. And there's an impact on the effort of your people. So clients hate it when you go back and say, there you go, there's a change request. That's the, the impact. Um, and to avoid a lot of those discussions, which are quite difficult to have with a client, because you end up always saying, you're right, were you wrong, were we wrong, were you right, were we wrong? You know, you sort of go in circles. To avoid that, I think you've made the point here is this is a critical stage of the project where you want to really lock down those requirements to say, have we got complete agreement before we right. actually start to develop anything? So really good. I like this slide, a lot of good stuff in there. If we can move on to the next one very quickly, so we can give some more people opportunities. Design, again, everything you've got here would fit in the design stage, creating the MVP, UAT scripts, developing those, uh, you know, doing, the, getting the, the thing tested, those, those uh, Sprints, sprints typically end up with a UAT at the end and getting users to test and give you feedback. So all the stuff right. we see here is really good. And then if we go into the final one, which was uh, deploy, 
again, everything you see there today is everything that I would put in the deploy stage. Again, very, very important things there around offering training, making sure right. you think about how you're going to train the people, uh, setting the right expectations that people will need to be out of the business to be able to do the training. How do you support those people once they go live? Because they'll, you know, once they're on the phone and they're taking calls on a customer service center, you know, something goes wrong, who do they call? How do you support them? Uh, and, and how do you support the client, you know, two or three weeks into deployment, you know, and, and there may well be still some bugs and things might not be quite at what they want and how do you sort of get that cleaned up. So again, some really good stuff here. So to me, that's a, yeah, brilliant presentation. You've, you've basically covered everything that I would have in, in those four, four stages. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your feedback. Thank you, Rachel. I know we will. See you around. All righty. Anuj. We'll bring you up on stage. Let's go ahead and shoot for five minutes for presentation and feedback so we can get a couple people more up on stage. Sure, uh, let me share my screen. <clears throat> Are you able to hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, okay, nice. And I just share my screen and let me know if you guys are able to see it. Okay. Yeah, looks good. Let oh, we got some, a, a, a <sighs> smolder head slide <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll share my complete screen is it good now yeah yeah okay and i was just making it as you guys were speaking so apologize if something is off target um uh, but this is something uh which i read in the case scenario um based on the stakeholder interviews that were conducted um it was highlighted that uh, slack uh was trying to have their b2b business move towards uh, the sales force, which they currently already have in their B2C. And I noted down uh, there are three buckets of problems that are there. One is the data management. A second is the cross-org transparency if they go towards the approach of multi-org. And third was towards the user training. Um, I'll tackle each of these in the next step, so I'm not spending much details here, but I have noted down why they are important for, for the client. Um, I have noted down a journal agile approach that um, we can take as a, a consultants from um, which help to solve this problem. Um, in the discover phase, um, as I said, the stakeholder interview we have already conducted and we got a bunch of insights into it. The key here is to empathize on, in, on my perspective, the three buckets which I have noted down and to find out what's more important currently for, for a user or the client and where they are struggling with. Uh, towards the design, a uh, define phase, uh, what I would propose is we can go down and create user stories and groom them and prioritize them so that we can, when we are giving them a complete uh, roadmap, we can focus on the most important ones first. Towards the design, and it depends on uh, what is the, uh, liking or what is the um, approach clients want us to take we can just go only by the low fidelity or also take high fidelity to give them more comfort into the end product and uh, as a discussion has already happened we should focus on the minimal minimum viable product or minimum level word product depending on what uh, a current organization is more most aligned towards towards the deploy phase the key uh, things that we can focus on is to uh, deploy, but also to seek a feedback so that next sprint or next product increment includes all the feedback or or anything that we missed out and we are able to correct it in the next uh, sprint for the client. Uh, in For the details part, I have noted down a specifics uh, in the discover phase. As a result of our, our interview process, uh, we should aim to create some kind of functional requirement document where it can be your business requirement document, uh, the technology may change, but it should capture each of the requirements that will be highlighted in those three buckets. Plus, we should be in alignment with, uh, it can be the case that there are different product owners. In this scenario, if there is only one, we should be in alignment with the stakeholders so that we are not two way, we are not away from the expectations. In the second phase, uh, which typically is more about defining uh, how we're gonna approach, uh, sprint planning is one of the things we should focus on. Uh, the second thing which I would want to focus on is the acceptance criteria so that there's always an alignment towards 
what we are trying to say as our end product and what has been agreed by the stakeholders. So we should pay close attention towards this. Uh, two points which I have made out clear here is the release product plan and the release plan, depending on how long our, our release is. We might be just focusing on a specific feature to be released at the end of each sprint, but this release plan will give a transparency to the entire stakeholders. What is to be like what this uh, product fits into the bigger picture. So um, this is something which I would propose in this defined phase. In the design, um, one thing which I generally would advise and I normally focus on is to conduct ceremonies to understand the impediment uh, so that if there are any blockades which are being, uh, our, our development team is facing, we should be able to understand that in the real time and work towards them to help them overcome that. Towards the deployment phase, um, I, I have proposed to uh, obviously release the product increment that we are working on, but also to conduct a UAD. Have someone from the client who is a key stakeholder or a key user or a power user who can at least give a go ahead for it to be um, uh, deployed and have a sign off so that there was an agreement on that. At the end, uh, also conduct a key user training or an end user training uh, if the time permits. Yeah, I mean, these are the three slides which are prepared for this task, right. Rachel. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Anuj. Yeah, brilliant. So there's, there's. Uh, if you just stay on that last slide for me, that's quite a, quite a good one. Which, which I'll sort of pick a couple of things from this slide. Um, so yeah, I mean, again, I don't think there's anything there that I would particularly sort of say it's in the wrong bucket. These are all things that fit neatly into into the the, the four Ds. Um, you mentioned, you, you know, there are there are certain things. Say, for example, in the design stage, you mentioned conducting ceremonies ceremonies to understand and remove impediments. Now, that's quite a uh, quite a common thing that that happens on agile projects. That the project team will have something they call a daily stand up. They typically last about 15 minutes. They're very short and sharp. Then they call stand-ups because typically you should be doing it standing up and not sitting down because it's very quickly going through, uh, running through your project team uh, and basically each developer saying, or giving an update on what's gone well, what hasn't gone well, and what are the challenges that they're facing. So the project manager has a very quick overview daily of progress and what are the impediments that are holding people up. Uh, so if a particular developer has got a challenge or a, a sort of blocker uh, that they can't move forward with development, then th th those things are identified on a daily basis and dealt with. So it's, again, part and parcel of the agile sort of process and, and you know, stand-ups are, are a ceremony, if you like, a daily, daily stand-up. Sometimes it may be every other day. So there's no hard and fast rule around that. Um, I think, yeah, the, the, the other points you make around the release plan um, and also, you know, sprint grooming or typically referred to as sort of sprint planning. So, you know, once you've got all your user stories, you need to be able to prioritize them. You need to understand which sequence, of, and which sequence they are going to be rolled out in in terms of sprint uh, because there'll be a logical sequence that they fit under. So that all of those things are, are pretty important. So there's some, yeah, a couple of things I wanted to pull out from this presentation, but well done, Aaron. There's some, definitely yeah. some good stuff there. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Awesome. Nice job, Anuj. And another example of how things look different and you can present things in various different ways and still get the point across. So Leanne, welcome back. We're going to put you in the pressure cooker. You got about five minutes, four or five minutes to present. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay, um, so this is different than what you've already seen. I was just working in a Word document or Google document, excuse me, um, while you were presenting. So I pulled up the scenario that you um, shared in the chat there, Rachel. And um, so my thing here is, you know, not on a slide deck yet. Um, but I looked at that rotation, the iteration that you were um, explaining of going through um, you know, kind of cycles, and that had five rather than than four. So um, planning and requirements analysis, I think both fit into the define. And here I'm talking about um, some things that were mentioned earlier. Why now, right? What are your pain points that we're trying to solve with this project? Um, getting into current and future state ideas, kind of approving what our scope of work is going to be, 
And then with that requirements analysis, kind of granular user stories that each have measurable outcomes and acceptance criteria, those are going to be approved to try and um, mitigate that creep. Um, and I'm going to try to identify some risk and potential roadblocks in this defined stage as well. Um, in design, I got a little bit more specific about where I want to be working. Um, so I'm going to do a low fidelity wireframe first to make sure we're on the same page and then make my MVP in a siloed environment for each person working on the project, like a sandbox. So I would have my own and Rachel, you might have your own um, where we're working on our individual user stories. Um, and then in my next phase, the do it, we're going to recreate those in our next environment, our testing environment, maybe a dev org where I'll be able to put together a change set for the entire release. Um, in that building phase, I want to do a health check um, and just make sure that there's no um, undue risk, anything that we can take care of from the beginning here. Um, and then finally, speeding on towards the deliver it and testing phase, we're going to come up with some UAT plans and scripts. Um, those are going to be tested against the user story acceptance criteria. We're going to create a final training plan and documentation, um, maybe with those Tango walkthroughs, maybe some of my business process maps, anything that we have showing the changes that I made to the org along the way, and we're going to finish with deploying it. Okay, great. Well done, Leon. Yeah, ex again, you know, very logical, and you've put the right things in. Those are the right stages of, of, of the the 4D's project life cycle. So yeah, very, very well done. Um, I mean, one thing I will bring out from this again, from a learning perspective, you touched on it, and it's something we haven't picked up is, you know, what is your release strategy? So we talked about the release strategy in, in the first one, but didn't really dive into it. But yeah, how, how are your developers going to work? Are they going to all have their own sandbox? And then you sort of bring in chain sets and merge that into a dev org. And if you're working on a very complex project, you know, with a lot of development teams, um, uh, you know, the, the, it might not just be the development in Salesforce that's going on, but you've also got a team that's working on MuleSoft, for example, and doing integration, and then you've got a team working on data. So how do you then manage all of those uh, those disparate teams to come together and, um, you know, make sure that whatever they're releasing doesn't break anything that you've already built? So release strategy becomes quite important when you're into complex projects and in terms of how you manage individual developers' workload and how, how you bring that workload together um, without breaking you know without breaking anything. So that's that's a, a key risk, I guess, in, in a large project as well, is, is yeah. how you release stuff. Absolutely. So, Especially good. because he wanted to have this in one place, right? His B2B now with his B2C. So I don't want to break what is already working for the other Correct. team while I'm building this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. So that 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 is pretty critical. And, it, and it's something that might might appear on your risk log, you know, um, as as a as an initial risk that, you know, we've already got a live system. We have to then be careful what we push through from your dev org and test org into the production, what we call production org, which is a live org. Um, so those steps need to be very tightly controlled. Otherwise, like you say, you know, suddenly you've got 200 users that have been happily using a system that find they can't use it on Monday morning because you've released something at the weekend that's broken it. And I've been on, I've been on calls on a Monday morning where that's happened and it's not, oh, not pleasant, right? <laughs> when you're having that conversation with a client where the entire business has stopped because somebody decided to push a change on a Sunday night and it's broken everything. All right. so, yeah. Well, thank you for the opportunity to thank share. Thank you, Leon. I, I hope you enjoyed my low fidelity release plan. Yes. yes low definitely. fidelity release plan. That's where it all started. <laughs> well done. Amazing, Leanne. Thank you for coming up and thank you for everybody that came up on stage today. I did pop a little link in the chat for all of you. If you would, please, we rely on your feedback to make these experiences as excellent as possible. So I'd love if you would take a second to pop that in. Real quick, Mo, as a wrap up, key takeaways. What do you think? Well, I'm pretty, pretty impressed with what we've seen today. I think the, the, the presentations we've seen um, really have captured for me exactly what the four d's are and at the right level so i hope that everybody's learned from that and thank you to all the presenters that have put the content together i know it takes a lot of time and effort and uh, confidence and guts to come up on stage and present but i think you've all done a fantastic job
which makes my job a bit easier because I can just pick out the, the stuff and sort of build around it. So well done to everybody. Um, great session. Thank you for that. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Mo, for being here. Look forward to seeing your book recommendation in the chat. I will and post that in Slack for you, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you. And this session will be available within 24 hours for you to watch and rewatch, revamp your presentations if you so choose. So without further ado, everyone, we will see all of you on the other side. Bye. Bye-bye.